Okay, we're live. Hello and welcome everyone here at the University Club and to those of you on Zoom. My name is Abby Fergus and I'm pursuing a master's degree in environment and resources. I'm working in the carnivore coexistence lab and working with a Bad River Band of Lake Superior Chippewa Indians in northern Wisconsin to research non-lethal deterrence to prevent predator livestock conflict on farms surrounding the Bad River Reservation. I'm actually a substitute today because our regular moderator, Chloe Green, wasn't able to join us today. There are six units on the UW-Madison campus that helped make this program happen by providing topic ideas, speakers, and student interns, and also by spreading the word. Each month, we tackle a topic related to food that's relevant to people of Wisconsin. We invite guests to share ideas and get us started but this is also meant to be a community conversation with our Zoom and University Club attendees. Up on the screen, you can see that we have some Zoomers logging in from Milwaukee, Dodgeville, Birchwood, Wisconsin, the Farmery in Green Bay. Thank you so much for signing in to join us. Next, I want to acknowledge our generous sponsor for food and the Wisconsin idea, Willie Street Co-op, which has three stores here in Madison and in Mid Middleton. As a thank you, we want to start off with a short video that we hope you enjoy. It's about a minute long. Willie Street Co-op is proud to be a supporter of Food in the Wisconsin Idea. Cooperatives around the state of Wisconsin have traditionally been at the forefront of bringing natural and organic foods to their customers. Cooperatives the world over are governed by seven cooperative principles, and the seventh co-op principle is concern for community. Concern for our farmers, supporting their livelihood, keeping money in our community. For 44 years, we have worked diligently to grow our local food system. That's actually part of our mission statement, so it's really core to what we do every single day. Thank you, Willie Street Co-op. <laughs> Today we're talking about food systems, a phrase that gets used a lot around campus and all around the state and country, but what do we really mean by it? What does it mean to take a systems approach to food-related problems or opportunities? When Greg looked for a graphical representation of food systems, he found a lot of them, and one of our guests, Dr. Kate Clancy, pointed him to a report that was released in 2015 by the Institute of Medicine and the National Research Council. To give some introductions before we start our conversation, Kate served on a committee that helped to design the framework that's referenced in the title, and um, here's the main graphic that she recommended. This report is 445 pages long, the authors explain that a food system is woven together as a supply chain that operates with broader economic, biophysical, and socio-political contexts. They identified characteristics of food systems, such as individual adaptive actors, feedback and interdependence, heterogeneity, spatial complexity, and dynamic complexity. If you want to dig deeper into that, also look for a link in the chat box box and Zoom, and you can download the report for free. With that said, Kate just landed here in Wisconsin for a five-day visit, and we're going to get the conversation started. For a formal introduction, Dr. Katherine Clancy is currently a food systems consultant, a visiting scholar at the Center for a Livable Future Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, adjunct professor at Tufts University, and senior fellow in the Minnesota Institute for Sustainable Agriculture of the University of Minnesota. Also joining us today is our own Michelle Miller, Associate, sit, excuse me, Associate Director of the Center for Integrated Agricultural Systems here at UW-Madison, where she has worked on a variety of food system issues since 1997. She also served on the board of the Willie Street Co-op and currently serves on the Wisconsin Farmers Union Foundation Board. 
Welcome to both of you and thank you so much for joining us. Our first question today is, in your own words, can you speak to your background a little bit more and experiences and how those developed your understanding of food systems? We'll start with Michelle. So um, Greg teasingly suggested that maybe we were born this way. Um, and actually, there's something to that. I think um, uh, systems thinking was something that my parents did, their brothers and sisters did, my grandparents were systems thinkers, and I think in part that's because they were farming, and they were managing multiple systems, complex systems on a regular basis, and to be able to make a living farming, they really had to be systems thinkers, so I attribute it to that. That's, no, no, no. Okay. Um, in answer to that question, I would say I think I was born this way. I didn't know that, uh, but as I went through school, high school and college and graduate school, people suggested that must be the case. And I said, oh, I don't think I know exactly what you're talking about, but I'm glad that I do this. And um, I also had a very important, very important experience in graduate school, which uh, sent me on my way, I believe. And that is, um, I was invited along with another graduate student to join a group of mainly senior professors culture in the College of Biology to develop the first major in the conservation of natural resources. And um, I was then thrown into a group of people who were ecologists and every possible discipline you can imagine. And we helped put the major together and then I got to teach in it for a couple of years. And that really formed kind of my very important background for all of this based on a particular food system or issue or project that you are knowledgeable about, maybe one that you worked on, researched on, and that took place in a real place. So first I want to know what food system you picked. Well, while he's messing around with that. Um, so, um, so we were out in the Driftless area a number of meetings for people to talk about what was going on in their area for them as farmers serving the Madison area um, and broader than that. And uh, they had two big issues. One was labor and the other one was transportation. So that's why, that's how we got started looking at transportation. And the project that I um, was thinking about is not one that I worked on <clears throat> and not one that I know backwards and forwards, but it's a very interesting project. It's called the Eastern Broccoli Project. And it is uh, functioning out of Cornell University. And it is a true systems project, although they don't use that terminology much in the project. And the idea is, still after 10 years of this project, to, to bring back or to de redevelop a, a strong broccoli industry in the East Coast. And it has um, faculty members on it who are from all possible disciplines. It, it's multi-state. It covers most of the states on the East Coast. And um, people from Extension are involved with it. They have a lot of people, a lot of farmers in it. They have a lot of seed companies in it, of course. They have retailers. They have wholesalers. And they are working this very big project to get a, new, a crop into the Northeast where they know there's a great demand and it would be a good thing to do. Thank you both. Now I just want you to explain to us what the goal was in terms of changing the system or maybe creating the system and whose goal it was. Um, well, um, we had a number of farmers saying, we want to sell product into Chicago, but we can't get it in there, uh, into the city in an efficient way to make it um, profitable. And so looking at transportation was really their goal um, to try to figure out. Um, another thing I want to mention really quickly is that um, basically we've been creating scaffolding for local and regional food here in um, the south central Wisconsin probably since maybe the late 60s, early 70s. And that scaffolding started out as Dane County Farmers Market and the, and the co-ops, the food co-ops. And then um, from there, some very small farmers, basically gardeners could start to sell product at farmers market and then think about getting bigger. And then we had people decide, well, we can grow a lot more food than that, so why don't we do the CSA thing? And then um, after um, uh, growing in, um, at a CSA scale, they started to realize we can sell into wholesale markets. So we've been creating the scaffolding over the last what is that, 40 years? Um, since Willie Street Co-op started. Um, 
And so this is just a continuation of that work. And I already answered part of the question about the goal. The goal was to establish a broccoli industry in the East Coast. Um, but what I want to get to a little bit right now is what were the kind of components of it so that you get a better idea. They um, <clears throat> saw that in order to address it, they had to address the entire system all at once. And so there are projects within it where they are developing germplasm. They are working with breed. They've worked with breeders. They continue to do that. They are um, developing varieties that extend the growing season, and, and that can be adaptable in the East Coast. They're also developing varieties that taste better because the East Coast has produced broccoli forever, but it doesn't have the same taste as the um, Guatemala and, and the and the California broccoli. And so that's a thing they're doing. Then they want to find they're finding a suitable grower base to supply markets that they're helping to build, build that are already there, that, but they're building new ones. They are establishing a distribution system, and they're working on evaluating a retail acceptance. So it's all those pieces that have to go together. Thank you. Now we want you to talk about a major obstacle or two that was involved in changing or creating the food system um, when people were trying, sorry. That was a question. <laughs> okay. Um, so my very first obstacle was that I know nothing about trucking. I know nothing about freight. I knew very little about packing vegetables for wholesale um, market. Um, and so, um, and I didn't understand the mental models that were behind the language that, was, that I was hearing. I, I went to a number of different conferences on transportation and could hear um, <laughs> okay, um, and um, could really see that um, I had to get a grip of, I had to get the language down first, and then I had to understand how that formed mental models. And that takes time um, to be able to do that kind of, it's like translation work, really. Um, my background is in anthropology, so I do, that's my field work, right? I go in, I try to learn a language, understand the mental models and how things are set up. Um, and the time that that takes is often time that a grant proposal won't cover. <laughs> um, I don't know a lot about what the um, obstacles to the Broccoli Project have been for a, a while, but I'm sure that, having worked on a lot of systems projects, that um, given the array of people, the, the geographic distance they were trying to cover, the different disciplines that had are part of it, along with all of the industry folks that are part of it, that it's taken that it probably took them a while to get everybody on the same page and to keep working on the same page, which is um, a task. It, it's not, not that easy to do. Um, I know that they, uh, the seeds, the, the, the new seeds have been in the marketplace for quite a while. I don't know how much uptake by growers there has been of that. Um, I do know that the biggest criticism that this project took and probably is still taking, is that they were working with Monsanto as one of the, the seed companies, and um, I don't have any problem with that, which you will hear me talk about a little bit later, uh, but, but I suspect that was another, you know, that's another thing they had to deal with and explain to people why uh, it was important that they worked with seed companies of all different sizes, not just the small ones, in order to get up to the volume that they're trying to get. Thank you. So, given those obstacles, how did you or those involved in these systems overcome that or other issues using a systems approach to change what was going on before the action? Um, so, a food system is a complex system. It's got, uh, it works at multiple scales, very small, you know, a scale of the soil and soil life all the way to um, the scale of a city and how a city is organized. And so um, um, I saw it as kind of as, as scouting the complex system. I was a scout. I was going into this complex system and trying to understand all the different pieces and how they fit together or didn't. Um, and uh, wandering around in a complex system <laughs> can be um, challenging, um, but I was really fortunate to have a lot of really good teachers, a lot of good colleague, colleagues who understood um, um, different aspects and we're willing to share with you. So I think that was a really key piece, um, collaboration. 
And I'm going to answer that question not with the Eastern Broccoli Project, with, but with the uh, really extensive systems project that I've been working on for, it's, it ended a year ago, but we've been working for eight years, and that's the EFSNI, the um, Enhancing Food Security in the Northeast Project. And what I wanted to point out with this answer was that it was very, we learned an enormous number of different things in this project all around a market basket of foods. And our goal is very much strongly related to maintaining and building the strongest regional food system that we can in the Northeast, the 12 Northeast states. And I just want to give you one example of where there's an obstacle. We did enough research in, in different pieces related to the foodstuffs we were looking at that we found out that it, it's not going to happen that we're going to develop knowledge and interest in regional as opposed to local or national or global if we start with consumers because consumers aren't ready for that. But who's ready are the wholesalers in the system. And um, if, any, if anybody goes ahead and tries to develop more champions and more support for looking at regional, um, it will probably be at the wholesale level. Thank you. My next question bridges a little bit away from food systems to talk specifically about some of Michelle's background. Something that stuck out to me about your work is the work you've done on the power dynamic between rural and city areas. I moved here from the North Woods and work with long-term community members up there. Frequently, those who live in the North Woods ask me to bring their messages down to Madison because they don't experience their voices being heard or problems being addressed by the government or the university or some other entities that are more based in Madison than in the North Woods. So Michelle, I was hoping you could speak a little bit to the power dynamic that you mentioned and um, answer some questions like what is the power dynamic between rural and city areas and what should city dwell dwellers know about rural people? <laughs> you really put me on the spot. <laughs> um, so uh, how many of you are from District 11? John Hendrickson back there should know what I'm talking about. Um, how many people watch the Hunger Games? Okay, so in, in hung, Hunger Games, it was really about an extractive uh, relationship between urban and rural. And, you know, that's the dystopian vision that hopefully we aren't there yet, but in some ways we are. You know, we're, I just drove from Colorado through Kansas and um, Iowa back home this last weekend, and it was heartbreaking to see some of those rural towns. There, were nothing, there was nothing there. If they had anything there, it was a Cargill elevator. I saw a lot of um, um, addiction issues just driving through these little towns. Um, and to me, that's an extraction. We've had big companies like Cargill come in and just pull the wealth out of the land and send it to wherever they send it for whatever their purposes um, are. So it's this idea that you know, either we can have an extractive relationship with rural, between rural and urban um, people, or we can have a collaborative collaborative relationship and so I'm hoping that we're learning more about how to collaborate but really what what it requires is that the people who are in the more power powerful position be the ones reaching out and making it possible to collaborate we can't expect the people who are being um, who are less powerful in the system to do that really we need to be the ones reaching out thank you so much sorry for putting you on the spot Kate, this next one is for you, and what stuck out to me about your experience was your work with different types of entities in food systems. So I want to ask you if you can speak on the dynamics between governments, universities, community members, and other entities that might collaborate on a food system issue, and how those groups can work successfully together. Yes. Um, <clears throat> I think most of, most of the answer to your question, Abby, really relates to um, any kind of question, which is how do you use a systems approach, or how do you do interdisciplinary research, or how do you do an interdisciplinary project? Because 
whenever there's people from different places at a table together, um, a, lot of, a, a lot of the same issues arise, a lot of the same facilitation is necessary, a lot of the same understanding is necessary. And that means basically making a project work so that people can start to trust each other. And it doesn't matter where they're from. It, I mean, it really, it really doesn't matter. It, it can be any mix of different people. So you have to have incredibly helpful processes that at least most people buy into, even if they don't understand them right at the beginning, to bring people together. Uh, one of the first things you have to do is people have to decide together and buy into the goal for the project. And, and for systems projects, there may be multiple goals. Um, and um, so um, you, you need a lot of time. You need a lot of respect. Uh, you need a, a good facilitation. You need good objectives. And you need people to realize, everybody in the group to realize, it, especially if you start bringing them into these systems projects, they're going to, in many cases, think a lot more deeply about some of the issues they're interested in than they have before. Um, the, what, what, the, what keeps the process going, which is so useful, is people laying, being challenged in a good way to lay out the assumptions that they're making all along the way. And we don't, a lot of work doesn't happen that way now. Um, that everybody is forced to really be clear about what their assumptions are, what their own goals are, uh, this is all called, some, a lot of this is called soft systems. Those are just hard systems like IBM uses with people in them. And everything we do in food systems is a soft system, uh, almost all of it anyway. And uh, so that's, that's the kind of thing that you have to do. Thank you so much. We're going to open an up audience soon, but this is my last question for you too. We've been talking about um, obstacles in a system that you picked out, but now we want to think on a little bit of a larger scale. So maybe from, well, you talked about the East Coast already, but to give you context, this is for large scale food system problems. Um, if we want to make real meaningful change in food systems at a larger scale, can you speak to specific obstacles or challenges that relate to the larger scale that people would face and um, if you have any advice on overcoming those issues that come with a larger scale project. Uh, I guess for this question, I'd like to um, uh, encourage everyone to take a look at Danella Meadows' work on leverage, leverage points. <laughs> That's weird. <laughs> All right, I'll try not to say the whole thing. <laughs> Um, Danella Meadows was an amazing systems thinker, and uh, she died in, I think it was 1999 or 2000. Um, but she left behind uh, a, a number of really important articles. You can download them off the web. You can buy them as books. Um, the leverage points um, in a system is a really helpful piece. Um, she identifies 12 different leverage points for creating change within the system and talks about them in and has um, prioritized them in terms of effectiveness. Um, what, uh, the, the, what she considers the least effective is to look at data. Now, to some degree, looking at data, um, especially in the era of big data, where we can start to see patterns in data that we couldn't see before, we had the algorithms that we have today to, to analyze them, um, the data sets. Um, you know, maybe that's not quite as true today as it was when she was writing this many years ago. Um, but at the same time, there is something to be said in getting lost in the detail. And that um, while we need the detail, we need to be able to think beyond the detail. The, at the far other end of the spectrum is narrative and the importance of um, storytelling um, to communicate new ways of thinking and new ways of behaving. And I think we've done a lot of work on narrative. Um, and we've done a lot of work on data, but there's a whole bunch of other leverage points in between, and maybe we need to employ more of those leverage points to really be able to lift and change the system to be something that's better functioning than the one we have today. This is funny. I have the same 12 points that <laughs> Michelle has. And uh, so I'm going to say a couple, a couple of different things. One is um, in in some of laying out Adele, uh, Donna, Donna Meadows' principles, 
the end point, the hardest one is to change the paradigm. And um, so I think it's really important when you're doing systems research that you, first of all, recognize that there are multiple places to intervene in a system. You don't always want to think that anything you're going to do with a systems approach is going to change that system. And the reason is, by definition, you mentioned complex adaptive systems. That means all the systems that we're working with are always changing. Farmers are always adapting, and they're adapting even more right now. And a lot of people are working on their projects forgetting that farmers are adapting. Uh, so that's one way to kind of start applying some systems principles to the work that you're doing. Um, I, I also, you can get to a point where if you, if you set a hard goal, you're likely not to reach it because it, working with, you know, 30 different people from different disciplines over eight or 10 years or something, things will change and people will learn different things and technology will change and all of that. So that's, so adaptability is really critical in it, what they call adaptive management for doing this work. So. Thank you both so much for tackling those questions for us. Now we're going to open it up to our audience. Um, we're going to prioritize the Zoom audience first. You can either share with us some of your thoughts or ask questions of our two guests. Um, if you made a comment or asked a question in the chat box, let us know if you're willing to come on camera and unmute your mic and ask it live because um, we want you to really engage with this conversation. Maybe we could get some representation from people, people who have different issues that we, than we've talked about. Anyone brave enough? Otherwise, we can open up to the studio audience for now. Okay, we have a question in the chat box. Since the current food system is competitive, how do we build collaboration? Do either of you want to address that question? You know, it's, I mean, I know everybody is, must be sitting here and thinking, gosh, this is the same question we're talking about politics right now. Um, and in a way it is. Uh, you build collaboration slowly and you um, find um, common ground to start with. And you build, um, you ask the right questions so that people are forced to listen carefully to each other when they're answering them. You set up an environment. It, I'm putting a lot on leadership at this point, and, but I think that's appropriate. I think that um, it takes pretty good leadership to bring uh, a lot of people who don't, especially who don't know each other or particularly who might be competitors. There are competitors in the Broccoli Project. Uh, and... Uh, I don't know how uh, the group at Cornell brought them all together um, e exactly, but I'm sure that the, the long-term goal of a new broccoli industry helped a lot. A lot of things are, not, are more abstract than that when you're working um, in, in a lot of these projects. So you, you have leadership and shared leadership among people. People know that they're being listened to and that... Um, the other problem, as many of you who have worked in food systems know, it's really hard to bring people across the whole supply chain together because the producers think one way and the retailers think completely differently and the processors won't even stay in the room. That's been my experience because they want things done immediately and they don't like process. And so you have, so I mean, all, <laughs> yeah, processors don't like process. Yes. So, um, it, and I'm making, I hope I'm not making this sound difficult. People are doing a lot of this work everywhere around the world, and they're doing more of it in Europe than they're doing here. But um, it, it's working, and I wanted to mention in, in response to my first answer, you know, I probably have been a systems thinker kind of forever, but I don't know system science. I don't have the knowledge that a system scientist has who's studied systems, but I know just enough to help make projects work, you know, I mean, that's, and you can learn to do systems thinking. I mean, that, that's the end, the bottom line. Sure. Um, so um, I was going to talk a little bit about um, how I grew up in the co-op movement. Um, so I saw 
cooperation as the opposite of competition. Um, but as, I, as I've looked at the food system more, um, I see two other areas. One is collaboration, which isn't exactly cooperation, but it's closer. Um, and also pred predation. So, um, for instance, um, United Natural Foods um, is, uh, has um, explicitly called itself a predatory company. Uh, they came in and they bought a lot of cooperative um, uh, warehousing um, infrastructure that was available, and they're proud of that. They're proud of being predatory. And so I think it's very difficult to work in a, um, in a collaborative way with a predatory company. So I think understanding um, what kind of company you're trying to work with and are they able to collaborate, is that part of their mental model of how they run a business, um, is a really important um, step in looking at food systems partners and how you might um, develop and, and correct a, um, a failing food system. Kate mentioned that um Consumers weren't ready for the regional food model, which was interesting, but I kind of have no idea what that means in the flesh. We, uh, we know this from doing a, uh, one of the multiple things we did in the project was a lot of focus groups. And um, we were particularly interested, knowing that regional has not been out there as a scale that people were asked to relate to yet. Uh, local has been out there a lot for 30 years now or more. And so we found, uh, we found out a lot of really interesting things, including the fact that immigrants in our focus groups got regional immediately, and people who, and other people did not get it as, as a scale that they might think about. It makes sense that immigrants would be much more aware of a larger scale and larger food systems. Um, so uh, what, and then we did a lot of research in a different team to look at supply chains. And we really studied, uh, we really studied supermarkets really carefully in low-income areas in the Northeast. And we found out some interesting things. For example, that um, near the end of the project, we were talking to expert supermarket people, and they were telling us that they were already uh, labeling their foods in their markets as regional because it was really hard to supply the demand just from local, and they didn't want to be misleading people about where the food was coming from, so they were already using the term regional. And also, we found out, and many of you would know who have been studying this for a long time, that wholesalers really are the linchpin in supply chains. And so uh, we are making recommendations that as we go on individually with this work or other people do this work, that it's in the middle of the supply chain that, we'll probab that it w it's probably going to work better to start bringing people to the knowledge of a different scale and the importance of all the scales having to relate to each other. Um, the question I have or the comment is how do we make people who are in leadership positions understand the importance of that kind of, I'm going to call them the gardener of the entire system. This is the nonprofit kind of work. We have our, in the garden, you have your potatoes and your carrots, and, and we'll say those are the equivalents of your growers and your processors. But when you're trying to create a system that functions, you need that person that is not so deeply engaged in their side, you know, their, their vegetable, but who says, I have the time to make the hundred phone calls. I have the time to create those meetings to get you all in the room. And I see all of your needs, not just each one of your needs. I find that to be a critical component. And counties are not going to are not going to hire that person, even though it's, it's core economic development work. Finding, you know, here in the sophisticated Dane County, you have your university system. But in our rural counties, people don't understand that you need to pay that glue person. They don't want to pay that person. They think that person should magically appear and work forever and um, not need to live. And I'm wondering how we get our grantors and our government to pay for the glue person. 
Michelle looks excited. Um, so uh, as Kate had said earlier, trust is a really important component of this, and it takes time to develop trust. And uh, when a bunch of us were in Atlanta uh, for, another, for a meeting, um, we happened to go the, to their original little market that's downtown, and they had the history of the market on the wall. They had like bits and pieces of newspaper articles, that sort of thing. So back in the 20s, these um, men who did wholesaling and restaurants and um, were purchasing from wholesalers, uh, they, um, uh, they had notice on the board of how they and their wives would have these dinner parties. And that's how the wholesale um, um, distribution center started. It was a social thing, right? And it was the glue of the men and their wives who, you know, who knows what the history of their wives was and what they actually did to make that thing start. Um, and that is probably the unpaid glue of that, of that original um, beginnings of that wholesale market. So here we are, um, most women I know have a job, um, often full-time, more often full-time than not, and um, don't have time to be the glue for free. <laughs> so that is, a, that is a big issue, and it gets at a lot of our... Um, all our stuck feelings about labor and about um, being paid for the t for our time and our effort, um, and that um, not surprisingly was that second issue that was of real interest to those driftless farmers was labor. You know who gets paid for doing what work and why. So right on. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I would just add that I. I think that role can be played by a lot of different people. Um, and a lot of the projects that, that are going to be done around this are not going to be just at a community level, almost by definition. They have, they're going to function at a larger scale. And so the, you need a glue person at, at, for any kind of project, but it could be a lot of different people. And I don't argue at all with the fact that they need to be paid. And they need to... And, and they should be paid because it takes a lot of skill and a lot of smarts to play that role and know how systems thinking might work among a whole bunch of different people and, and all of that. So, yeah. I would point out, I do want to point out um, that it, in various places, extension is playing a very important role in some of these projects all over the country. Thank you. What a great question. Now we have a question coming in from Washara County. Can you log in and ask your question, please? Sure. Can you hear us in Washara County? Um, we're working on the volume. Just one moment. Can you try again, please? Can you hear us in Washara County? Our yes. question is, um, did you, with the systems that you were looking at, did you look at the sort of secondary distribution points, like food pantries and uh, maybe restaurants and others, uh, that would be not not the grocery store or supermarket necessarily, but other ways of distributing food. And depending on the project, people are looking at all possibilities. In our own project, we only looked at supermarkets in low-income areas. Uh, so many other people are already doing all the corner store work and, and the farmer's market work, et cetera. And we were really interested in, main, in main, almost mainstream supply chains. We needed to know better how they work and what might, we might be able to expect of them. I would just add that um, one of my favorite reports is a uh, food flow um, uh, analysis done for the five boroughs um, of New York. And that was really interesting because they looked at all of those nonprofit um, um, distribution points as well as the for-profit and could show um, how much food was coming into the city and how it was moving through the city. It was a very interesting report. Thank you. We have another Zoom question about options to support this movement of creating sustainable food systems in ways perhaps besides buying locally. This question is coming from a dietitian who works with low-income clients and they're reluctant to recommend buying local food because it can be expensive at times, but they're also not sure if that is changing. Um, I guess I look at you through the camera. <laughs> um, so uh, 
my thought when I uh, heard your question was that one of the things about systems is we'd like to see systems um, um, self-organize and emerge from um, a set of circumstances that allow them to emerge. And one of those things that I think really needs to emerge in low-income um, uh, neighborhoods is that groceries then are um, owned by the people who live in that neighborhood and emerge from that neighborhood to serve the needs of that neighborhood. Um, an example of what you don't want to have happen is the city of Chicago to put $13 million into a Whole Foods uh, being plopped in the middle of a, of a, a, a low-income neighborhood that then gentrifies um, because of the store. And so um, that issue of how you, um, uh, one of the ways to get food systems moving um, uh, where neighborhoods can have groceries emerge is to increase the food flow into that area, um, increase the wholesale access of fresh fruits and vegetables so that a small grocer can afford to come in purchase at a wholesale price those fruits and vegetables for sale in their neighborhood. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw another kicker then. Um, because uh, I, and we, I'm from the Northeast. You guys are in Wisconsin. Okay, this fits here too. Um, uh, and I'm originally a nutritionist. I think that for one of the things that we need to be working on is uh, with a systems lens, is to realize that processed foods, when they're processed appropriately, especially frozen foods and low salt canned foods, are very important. They're not just, and not just for low income people's diets. They're one of the things that keep farmers going if you produce in an area that has a very short growing season. And so I do feel, this probably sounds like heresy from a nutritionist, that we have oversold fresh fruits and vegetables in terms of thinking systemically about where is the entire diet going to come from and how is it going to be healthy and how is it going to make money for everybody in the supply chain. Thank you. We're going to move back to our audience here in the university club before going back to Zoom. So does anyone else here have questions or comments? Um, I wanted to kind of bring it back to the comment that you made, Michelle, about predatory companies. And I think those kinds of companies who are willing to go out and seek those loopholes in the systems or like the example you just brought up with the Whole Foods, going into a community who is already vulnerable, those are some of the biggest issues that I see in the system and those are problems. So while they might be predatory and not able to work with us on a collaborative scale, like what are we to do with those issues, you know? <laughs> Um, well, this is kind of a comment from a prior question that gets at that maybe from a side point, which is um, to, to bring in systems thinking and think about all the different ways in which um, like advocacy is engaged with food kind of before the commonplace nature of local food. So I think about as an elementary student, we did food drives. <clears throat> and so to bring that forward in Milwaukee, uh, we were working with a food pantry um, to grow in some hoop houses. Um, and what we are, what to bring into the narrative piece that you talked about, you have data and you have narrative. And so what I wonder is why we can kind of sit back and allow um, food drives to continue where you run off to Sam's Club or Walmart, pick up cans of food that both imp Theoretically, now I, I get your point about processed food, but thinking about the dignity of the work of growing that food and what farmers may or may not be <clears throat> earning from growing that food, not to mention the workers in these stores, which kind of gets to your point about retail. And so instead, what we were trying to say is, well, what if we did a food drive <clears throat> where instead of donating cans of food from low-wage uh, retail that's really from low-wage farmers, what if instead we uh, pooled money that was then used to purchase from <clears throat> area farmers. And so the, you have the dignity of the farmers, but then you also have the dignity of the consumers. Um, so threading that to the extent that it can. So thinking about the other ways in which, maybe not through uh, the kind of individual consumer, but <clears throat> through these systems that, that are kind of peripheral to this uh, local food system that we're doing. But these, these are elements that are still out there. And you know, food drives, I'm assuming, 
I haven't been in elementary school for a while, but I'm assuming these food drives continue. And to what extent um, are they continuing to shop at Walmart to say, we've got the most number of cans. And even maybe if you're going to Willie Street Co-op, which would be great, um, would it be also great to um, generate uh, pools of money that could purchase from local farmers and get that right, right to consumers who really need it? Thank you. Michelle, did you want to respond to? John reminded me of it. I heard, heard John say something back in the corner. Um, and the first thing is that um, if we've got, you know, people going hungry, it's because the system is broken. And if the system's broken, you, know, you can put a Band-Aid on it by doing food drives or whatever, but really you need to change the system to fix the problem. And so, um, John, um, back there, I don't know if you want to say this your own way, but um, one of the big issues is that this idea of concentration, whether it's in the, retails, um, the retail store area or at the farm level, um, where um, it's harder and harder for a small independent business to survive and that the bigger the supply chain has grown so big. And the control and the um, ownership of the food has all gone to just a handful of companies. You know, that's what we ultimately have to do. We have to address this power dynamic um, directly. And uh, this last weekend in Iowa, Storm Lake, Iowa, there was a great big confab with a whole lot of people um, talking about the need to address concentration in our food system. Uh, what are there, four meat companies for beef? Is that what it is? Um, and, I mean, pigs and chicken ha have long gone that direction. Um, many of the organic um, companies that started up in the 70s and 80s have been purchased by very large companies. So trying to figure out how to um, stop this kind of, um, oh, what's it called? A vicious cycle of, um, of stores buying up each other and concentrating is a really key piece. Um, it's something that needs to happen again. It happened 100 years ago, and we need to do it again. Thank you. We have a few more minutes. We're going to turn back to some Zoom questions. The first one is, where in Europe can we look for these collaborative food systems that you mentioned earlier, Kate? I'm thinking... Uh, um, more about a lot of work that researchers are doing, but they are all over Europe. There's no particular place. They're everywhere. A lot of the research that you and I probably grew up with came out of um, England and, well, and Wales. Uh, the EU made a commitment not just to put a ton of money into research on systems, food systems in Europe, but also to put a ton of money on rural development specific projects on the ground that are systems projects. And systems thinking led to um, a projects, what well, many of them are, uh, are under the aegis of LEAD. If you Google LEAD, you will see all the rural development agriculture food systems work that's been done by large groups of both researchers working with community folks and working with governments and um, in, in local areas, in much wider regions, uh, et cetera. Thank you. We're going to ask one more Zoom question. Uh, the, the, the try part question, we're just gonna randomly pick one of it. Let's see, lucky question number two, have we, disrupted the natural systems of nature in exchange for profitability at the farmer, worker, and cons at the expense of farmers, workers, and consumers, and their health? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the important piece is that there's a lot of really good research going on to um, uh, deal with that, to, to uh, that's being directly related to um, nitrogen, phosphorus, water, everything, all kinds of incredible people around the world doing research on how to do that and then extending it out to farmers as soon as they possibly can to help farmers change the way that they're producing foods. Yes, but the reason that's happening is that, uh, yeah, the, the systems we've used for the last 60 years have wreaked havoc. 
Thank you for all those wonderful questions and responses, everyone. Thank you to Kate Clancy and Michelle Miller for joining us here in Madison, and thanks to everyone on Zoom and in the studio audience. We also want to thank um, the six campus co-hosts of these events and the Willie Street Co-op. In a week or two, we'll have this episode edited and up on YouTube. We don't have details worked out yet for the next event, but we're looking at having it on May 1st or 2nd with the theme, What is Healthy Food Really? Scientific and Community Views on Nutrition. If you have any input for good speakers for this topic, you can let Greg know by po posting feedback in the chat box or finding him today. The last thing for those who have joined us here, please join us in the other room across the hall. We're going to turn the lights off here so that everyone can move over, buy a drink, eat some very good and free food, and continue the conversation because I'm sure there are a lot more questions and comments out there. Happy spring, everybody.